what do you think you are? You're some, you're a minded body. You're some mixture of genes and hormones and, you know, uh, chemistry that was partly the product of the early environment in the womb, plus personal experiences. You're all of that stuff. And when you make a decision, um, it does come from you if it comes from that stuff. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 186. And this episode is with Janan Ismail. And take note, as this is indeed the canonical pronunciation of her name. She is the William H. Miller III Professor of Philosophy at Johns Hopkins University, where she researches the philosophy of science, cognitive science, metaphysics, physics, and mind, all of which we touch on in at least some capacity, I think, in this episode, which, incidentally, Janan packed with all sorts of insights. So it was very cool to hear her string them together. And we talk a lot about self-reference in physics and how it relates to the arrows of time, but we also make digressions to David Albert and Barry Lower's Mentaculus, a probability map of the universe, some of the interpretations of quantum mechanics, most notably the Everettian many worlds theory, and then some of the recent debates about determinism and free will. For that, you might be interested in Janan's book, How Physics Makes Us Free. And there's a link to that, along with her more recent book, Time, A Very Short Introduction, in the description. Reviews, likes, comments, all these things are so helpful. There is also a Patreon with a link to ad-free episodes, as well as show notes. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Janan. So Janan, I think that we may end up touching on uh, a bunch of your philosophical interests today, uh, physics, uh, metaphysics, mind, and so on. But where I wanted to start was the philosophy of physics. So I'm wondering if that was the first of your loves as you got into philosophy. Was that your entry? Um, actually, I came to philosophy quite late. So when I went to graduate school, I knew very little philosophy. I was learning a bit of everything. I had not encountered philosophy of physics yet, but, um, but I was feeling like there wasn't much that... Um, felt like it was good. I was at Princeton in the kind of late nineties and, you know, David Lewis was kind of the big metaphysical system builder. And so much of what was going on at that time is very like what it goes on right now in some parts of analytic philosophy, which is, you know, people offer metaphysical systems and then you compare them with one another according to how they fit intuitions. And that just didn't appeal to me at all. I felt like I wanted to be really in touch with um, a way of understanding things that didn't feel like it was just, you know, weighing virtues of systems against one another. Um, Martin Jones, at that time, fresh out of graduate school, hired by Princeton, so young guy, really sort of exciting, came in the first day of class and said, I'm going to, in, you know, he's teaching some non quantum mechanics, I'm going to pr prove this theorem. Um, and it's going to completely like rock your world. And I'd been in philosophy enough to know that no argument doesn't, you know, every argument has premises, premises are always optional, and this is just how metaphysics goes. And he wrote down Bell's theorem, and he proved Bell's theorem, and it was the first time, I mean, it hit me like, like a fist in the gut, in the sense that it felt really real, it felt really solid, it felt profoundly important, and the harder you pushed on it, the harder it was um, to see your way around it. And um, that was, you know, it completely bit me. And so that was my entry actually into philosophy of physics. I was already a second year graduate student. And, and from that moment on, I felt like now I feel like there's traction, you know, something real, something um, to think hard about. Hmm. 
Now, uh, what you said that really struck me was you weren't interested in what was going on at the time you were in Princeton, where people were introducing medical metaphysical systems and comparing whether they fit intuitions. And I have no idea if this, I, maybe this is, this came way before this wasn't going on when you were at Princeton. But what comes to mind, I just think of questions in the philosophy of time, like presentism or eternalism, people trying to debate whether or not these fit our intuitions. But the point being, maybe they weren't taking into account the the actual physics that might really well inform how people should be thinking about these issues. Is that sort of on the mark? Yeah, no, that's exactly. I mean, I, you know, what, what do intuitions do? There's something like the embodiment of a folk physics that was, you know, the pressures on folk physics are, you know, sort of everyday experience and captures regularities that are salient to embodied beings like us to get around, you know, an environment that's a very particular and select corner of the universe has, I mean, from the point of view of physics, it has absolutely no authority. And the way that I think of it is that physics um, is sort of the continuation of the methods of everyday sense, except that it has a much wider body of experience to draw on. It's much more systematic and precise in the body of experience that it has. And intuitions play no role in, I mean, just sort of, you know, one's you know, sort of armchair intuitions play no role um, in, in have no authority in judging between um, sort of scientific. So what there is, is there's experience, there's data, and then there are um, sort of the criteria that go into judging between scientific theories, which has something to do with simplicity and systematicity and non-ad hocness. Though it's a very different sort of process, but the authority of, of science comes really from the fact that um, the degree to which it allows us to, to predict and control experience. So, um, you know, nothing, metaphysics has been asking questions for 2,000 years, um, more than that. But the 2,000 years of recorded history that I know in the Western tradition sort of draws on, like things like, you know, what are space? What, what is time? What are we? How do we fit into the structure of the universe? Those are the questions I was interested in. But two millennia of philosophical speculation about these questions um, delivered nothing with the kind of predictive and uh you know the and precision that science in the 300 years that it's been going has has given us so um i think the 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 questions i was interested in were the questions of traditional metaphysics um but it was i mean it seemed clear to me that physics is where you go to answer those questions well, I think this has this was unplanned, but it's a perfect entryway into some of the topics I want to discuss with you. Namely, what I have in mind right now are self-reference, agency, time. Maybe some, they're metaphysical questions, logical questions, but uh, traditional philosophical questions. But that you discuss with very explicit. Uh, reference to the physics and in particular i have in mind um, thermodynamics and we'll, we'll get to that but what is the origin then philosophically or physically of your interest in self-reference and the universe so it's um it, it didn't come with it didn't start from an interest in self-reference at all so if you look at philosophy of physics, um, I mean, as a, so, I mean, I started out as a traditional philosopher of physics. I, I did, you know, dissertation on symmetry, interested in all of the questions that kind of form the kind of foreground of what someone studying philosophy of physics studies or space, time, or quant foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, but I think, you know, what you realize is that there, so all of the mysteries, all of the kind of big mysteries in in our understanding of the universe, a lot, but a lot of what 
plus is a physics study is stuff on the kind of the the four the oh what's the right word the frontiers of our understanding so the physics of the very small and the physics of the very large um, but what I sort of realized more and more was a lot of the real mysteries kind of surround um, something very close to home namely like sort of the human being and <laughs> how we fit into it and in, even in the places where people think that they're asking questions about physics um if you dig hard you find um in some uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about this in connection with time and also in connection with some of the other sorts of problems that i've touched on where if you dig around you 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 find them centering in some way on the relationship between experience the way that we kind of the world is presented to us in experience and the way it's presented to us in physics so kind of the big framing question in philosophy of time in at least in the parts of it that are engaged with physics are you know physics gives us this world um you know portrays time as one dimension of a four-dimensional manifold and all of the things that we associate with the experience of time and with the traditional understanding of time um there's no room for them in physics so there's been two sorts of reactions to this one is the people who ally themselves with physics and say, okay, what physics shows us. So if you take physics as authoritative about the structure of time, what physics shows us is that um, all of these things like flow and passage and so on, they're somehow illusory. And then there are other people, I mean, and I'm thinking here of the kind of Brooksonian tradition or people, you know, in, in philosophy of time um, who ally themselves with experience and say, actually, it shows that the physics of time is inadequate in some way. And for me, um, I've, you know, that problematic, trying to understand the difference between the way the world is presented to us in experience and the way that it's presented to us in physics, um, you know, it has something to do with properly understanding the way the world would look and should look if it's the way that physics describes from the perspective of a being who's, you know, situated in time, who, in, who interacts with the world through the sorts of channels that we interact with. It. So that, that's one example of the way in which, you know, a problem that's really a part of physics and part of, is, is forcing you to look a little bit harder at the human being and, and, um, and human experience and human perspective. Another one is obviously, f you know, free will. And again, these are questions that I, I tend to be like really attracted to mystery so there's some people who like they're attracted in philosophy to the problems where they think everyone else is confused but they really understand it um and i'm really attracted to things that i feel like i just don't understand and um i think the that the free will stuff so because i take physics seriously enough to think what to, to want to understand it you know what it's telling us about the world, but these are places where I really have a hard time reconciling it with, like really taking it seriously as a description of, you know, ourselves and our experience in the world. So it's the problem of, of agency, again, reconciling the way the world seems to us or presents itself in our experience, which is something very different from intuitions um, and the way that physics says it is and trying to, to reconcile the two with one another or trying to, to come to some stable position whether it's thinking, okay, well, our experience is in some way misleading, or whether it's or it's nudging a little bit at the physics and and trying to bring it more into alignment with the way we experience the world. So again, I you know, I've I've focused on those problems um, just because they confuse me, and what I think I've recently found is a sharp way. So this is where the self-reference stuff comes up, explicit self-reference. Um, I think in a lot of these different places where I've focused on, you know, because they've had, they've been problems of that form, I found a way to really understand in a sharp way, I think, the way they come down to something that in a different part of philosophy um, has been really deeply examined, which is the stuff about self-reference. So, so that's the way I've, I've sort of come in a roundabout way to focusing on self-reference late in recently. Okay, that's that's all terrific. Before we get to the self-reference, I, I just want to comment on something you said in the beginning of your response, which was about this 
this, in my words, this tension between experience and physics, because there's no room for the way we, apparently there's no room for the way we experience time in physics. And I have two quote, well, I have in mind two quotes that I don't have in front of me. Uh, one of Roger Penrose's, and I just think this is a good example where he says, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the one who who wrote about the quote, that we have this, I, this sense of becoming, a kind of universal becoming of, of time progressing. But general relativity tells us that it's it's not this way. There is no like universal progression throughout the whole universe. So there's this incompatibility immediately with this first person human understanding of time and then the physical understanding of time. And then the other thing that I just wanted to mention with you had a, a, a very nice quote that again, I, I don't have in front of me, so I can't say it the way that you do, but it had to do with this uh, tendency in metaphysics or the philosophy of mind to sort of get rid of dualism and get towards uh, a mind independent uh, sense of reality. But as you put it, there is no mind independent physics because minds are part of physics. Right. Hmm. So those are two very different sort of threads. Um, yeah. uh, let me take up the second one first, just because it's um, the one you said last. Um, so this is, I mean, this is really important. So a lot of the times, you know, when, when I'm thinking about these things, I'm talking to a philosophy of physics audience, um, they think, so, you know, re recovering, you know, a sense of passage or flow from, um, from the perspective of an embodied agent or something, they will say, or they will think, oh, well, this isn't a problem that's of interest to physics. You know, maybe if you're a philosopher and you're interested in trying to recover human experience, but it isn't something that physics has to worry about. But I think what one has to understand is human beings are parts of physics. And in particular, when it comes to, so more in the case of agency, when it comes to agency and understanding, you know, sort of the position of intelligence in the world, um, you know, intelligence moves matter around. Things behave in very different ways when there are intelligent people around or intelligent beings around um, than it would if there weren't. So there's no way of understanding the way that matter behaves um, without an, it, matter behaves in the parts of the universe that we occupy without understanding intelligence and its, you know, what it what it does to matter. So. I think you know that second quote was for me very much a part of, um, on the one hand, making it clear that intelligence and the way that intelligent beings represent the universe is part of physics. It's not something separate from it. It's not merely about interpreting physics from the perspective of intelligent beings, but it's also about taking serious. I mean, uh, the the other side of that is that if since we are embodied beings and we're parts of the world. When we're trying to represent the world from the inside, people have this idea, and it's one of these phrases that's bandied around a lot, that what we want to do is not understand, you know, to kind of separate out the objective from the subjective part. So we want to understand the mind-independent fabric of the world. And we want to understand, um, so what's the right way to put this? to understand what there really is. So very often people sort of uh, gloss realism about something by saying that it's part of the mind independent fabric of the world. So, you know, part of what what I was trying to say by, by saying that there's no mind independent fabric of the world is precisely that, that minds are parts of the world. And we there is no way of getting a complete catalog of what there is without including minds. By itself, that's a fairly minimal point, but I think it, it once you see the mind involvement in other things as well, you see that that it's it's actually a point that that um, infects a lot of things. So I think you know the that that particular quote had those two sides to it. The part the Penrose quote, um, 
that was really about specifically time. And it was, it was trying to put my finger on, you know, uh, a particular aspect of our experience of time that I think self-reference was really important to understanding. But it was really nice because Penrose, you know, has this beautiful paper back in, I can't even remember when it was, like late 70s or something where he's I talking- I think it was 79. I can 79, check. is that right? And he's talking about the ways in which, you know, we started to, so he's talking, he's really interested in the physics and he started to, to talk about the ways in which our understanding of um, the various arrows of time has started to fall into place. So, and that's some, that's a picture, a kind of architecture that's become more, that has come more and more clearly into focus since he wrote, but he said, but there's one thing that we don't understand. Um, and that's this, what he calls the feeling of relentless forward progression of the march of time. Um, and the way that he put it in that paper was, and this is why I liked the quote, because I think he puts his finger on exactly that. We have this sense of, of a world of kind of potential being narrowed down in, into actuality. So, um, uh, so of, I'm trying to remember now how he puts it. Something like, put, it's something about potentiality being um, uh, resolved into actuality as, as time moves forward. Um, and I think what I, I mean, what's important, what's interesting and important about that is as much as people have talked about the other eras of time, they've just stayed away from that one. And it is one that I think is very much um, a part of our everyday experience. And so I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to mm -hmm. talk about it in a way that connected it to sort of some of the things that relate to self-reference. Yeah, I think you refer to that arrow as the arrow of becoming, right? Becoming, yes. Okay, great. Well, since it connects to self-reference, maybe we should start with self-reference and toward introducing it for our listeners who might not be familiar with the immense philosophical, mathematical, logical uh, literature on the subject. It can be problematic, to say the least, in some areas like mathematics, set theory, or computer science, or, or language. But do you have any examples you like to use to illustrate this? Good. Yes. So a couple of things. First, you know, like like everybody at Princeton in the like 90s, we all studied kind of meta logic. It was, I mean, I think less so now, but back when I was in graduate school, it was very much a part of your, your education in philosophy that you learned a little bit of meta logic. So you learned, you know, um, you learned first order logic, but you also learned sort of all of the important soundness and complete incompleteness theorems in logic. So you ended with Gödel. Um, so that's, you know, just part of the prehistory of my own training in this, but it was, it's also, I think it became, um, uh, sort of, I think the common understanding of self-reference is it's just this big can of worms. And that if you're, if you're making a formal system, the one thing that you have to do with, do is stay away from self-reference. So that, that's a kind of, it, it was a part of the background of my understanding of, of, um, you know, sort of logic and stuff that the self-reference stuff was there, that it was problematic, that it was a can of worms and that it presented problems for formalizing things. Okay. Um, it wasn't until I started to think about it in a much more physically embodied concrete way that it no longer seems to me problematic, but it seems to me um, deep and rich and a uh, central piece of our understanding of the world. And it was a simple example like this, that um, I'm going to give you a very simple kind of embodied example of self-reference that made me think, think that actually it's not problematic. I feel like I understand it and I understand why it arises. Um, so I was thinking at the time of, um, I tend to think instead of human beings, I tend to think, put everything in terms of like a little robot, just so that you know that you're not, so that you have a mechanical system that's doing something like representing mm -hmm. the world, but there's no magic involved in it and you know you know, kind of how to understand it through physics, through in a purely mechanical way. And you also know how to understand, you know, um, in a non-mysterious way, you know, the fact that it's representing and so on. So I was thinking of a simple um, embodied computer, a robot. Um, and the idea was, what happens if you try to 
to take a robot like this and make it like a, a complete embodiment of all of our knowledge of the physical world. So what do you do? You program it with um, uh, sort of laws of physics and everything that we know about biology and all that we know about history and all of the contingent facts about the world. Um, uh, I mean, everything like from the color of bananas to the day that Robinson was born to how many hairs he has in his mustache. But, um, <laughs> is there, <laughs> sorry, is there, um, is it going to run into problems of any kind? As, well, yeah, you can always find a question that you can, uh, sorry, let me regiment a little further again, just to simplify things down to their most basic form. Any, I'm, I'm assuming that any question of fact can be stated in a yes, no form. And that the way that you, without loss of generality, that the way that this, this, um, system is gonna, it speaks your language it's, and you know the language has been resolved of ambiguities and the way that it's gonna answer any question is that you're gonna put a question in an input channel and it's gonna display a yes, no on um, an output channel. So here's, here's the self-reference part. You can always find a question that you can ask this thing that um, it's not gonna be able to truthfully answer. What is that question? It's a question of mundane physical fact. Is the answer that's about to appear in the output channel? No. Think about that for a second. It can't answer. But in some ways, nothing mysterious going on. The world is just the normal world, and there's a fact about what appears on the output channel, and you can see exactly what's going on there. It can't answer without rendering false the answer it gives in giving the answer. Um, so you might think, okay, um, well, what if we change the what if we change the format in which the answer is in which questions are asked, or what if we ask the question in a different way, or what if we construct the system? And so you can go around in your head about this for as long as you like. And this, I promise you, <laughs> give me any physical system and give me any language with a fixed semantics in which I can ask it questions of fact, I will be able to find a question of fact that it cannot truthfully answer. So what's going on there? What's going on there is pretty clear. I mean, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's exactly what I said, that it cannot give the answer without rendering the answer false. It's true of any physical system in the world. It is what it is to exist that some of what's happening in the world is stuff that it's doing. When it comes to creatures that are representing the world, creatures like us, so they're simultaneously part of the world and they're representing the world, it's gonna be the fact that um, it cannot come up with a complete kind of representation of totality without coming across the fact that some of what's happening is stuff that it's doing at the moments that it's representing the work. Okay. Um, so I call that interference. And by interference, mm. I mean that, you know, it occupies effectively two realms. You know, it's, it occupies the realm of being, so it can't exist without doing things. Um, but it's also representing the world. So everything that it does is going to register at the level of representation, right? Um, and moreover, and this goes back to the, the second quote that you put, that you brought out when we were talking about, um, and it's going to be the case that when it's representing the world, um, its representations and its representational activity are part of what's happening at the level of being. So you've got this kind of involvement of what's going on at the representational level and what's going on at the level of being that makes them inextricable in a way so i wanna i i think what the the stuff about self-reference um is doing is is making it in the sharpest clearest way um and in a way that's been fairly heavily studied that that kind of interference is going to be a unavoidable and two uh, b <laughs> sorry and b it's going to complicate um, the ability to give a complete, like to treat representation as though, you know, in the way that we, we generally like to treat representation, which is there's the realm of facts and then there's the realm of representations and truth is 
a kind of you know abstract mapping between the facts and what is you know so what is the case and how we represent it. It's going to show you no no when you take account of the fact that that representational activity is part of the world. That's going to make it impossible in some way to give a complete catalog of 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 um, of, of fact without encountering um, this this interference and all that the the good all that the the sort of what I call the girdle question that is this question that you can't answer truthfully is doing is it's it's taking interference and putting it negatively. I mean, it's making the never, the interference negative. The flip side of that is positive interference, which is. Of course, there are some questions that I can't not answer truthfully, like, is the answer that's about to appear in the output channel? Yes. Right. Um, but in going in going through the work, I mean, and, but that's a sort of clever way of making a point, which is a much more sort of basic truth that I've, that I think is involved in agency, which is, you know, there are some questions of fact that are going to be ultimately and ineradicably up to you, like the, some questions of physical fact. That you that facts about the world that you're not going to be able to stabilize independently of what you do, independently of what you think. Um, hmm. So and that's I, yeah. I think that this question of stabilization is directly connected to uh, the future and time. So maybe we'll we'll get to that in a moment. But I really like how this robot example. It really does make the phenomenon real and, and graspable and apparently problematic. And I also like how it connects this or it connects to this duality between representation and world. And this isn't a, a novel point at all, but the discussion of the importance of representation in the phenomenon of self-reference makes it a bit clearer why self-reference is such a linguistic problem since language is just in the business of representing things. That's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But now toward connecting. Okay, one more thing about that. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. I mean, I think too, it's, it's, and this is the, the way that the, the concrete example is different from uh, the mathematical examples. I mean, I think it's not different in the end, but it, but the ways in which it's clarifying. Um, which is that, you know, it's, it's not a problem about ontology. It's not that the world is incomplete. It's that you can't represent the world in complete detail from the inside because there's going to be these facts that you can't stabilize independently of how you represent them. So it's a problem really for representation. It's not a problem for ontology. Hmm. Well, this might seem like a bit of a diversion to our listeners, but toward connecting these metaphysical problems to physics, as we sort of began our discussion, where does all of this connect to the foundations of statistical mechanics and what David Albert and Barry Lower call the mentaculus. Okay, good. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to put a placeholder in, in two. It connects directly to quantum mechanics. Um, anyways, but for the mentaculus stuff and all of that, again, you know, I, I think it really is the, the Penrose point. So, you know, there, I think lots of stuff falls really nicely into place. And I work very much, you know, kind of within the program for understanding the errors of time that um, David and Barry work in. I think that's, I mean, I, you know, I think that's a, the powerful framework for understanding those things. The part that I don't think that they get right and the part that I think is really central to our experience um, is this, this feeling that somehow it can't be that the arrows of time are purely epistemic. So, you know, the, 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 what, so I'm going to back up a bit. Uh, and I know you've talked about this a lot on the podcast, but maybe it'll be helpful to see that the, the way that I, I'm thinking of these things. It's, it's so always funny. helpful to go over things tens and tens of times. Okay, good. As I always say, never underestimate the power of, of, of repetition. <laughs> but, um, 
But so the way that I think of these things and the, the understanding of the arrows of time is that there's this purely physics problem that started out with this idea that we've got these laws that are time reversal invariant. We look around us and lots of the phenomena that we observe seem to have a uh, you know, temporal arrow built into them. So we're just now talking about physics. You know, there are lots of macroscopic phenomena that happen. So, you know, what is time reversal invariance? The way that I'm going to understand it here is that, you know, the laws of time reversal invariant, if they say for every process that will take you from A to B, that's physically possible. It's there's also a physically possible process that will take you from B to A. So here's the way to see the problem. Um, is that you look around the world and you see all kinds of processes that in fact happen from A to B, but whose temporal reverse doesn't occur, misfit between the manifest temporal asymmetry of the phenomena at the macroscopic level and the time symmetry of the underlying microscopic laws. David, uh, so centuries of, of physics couple of centuries of physics, starting with Boltzmann and people coming after Boltzmann, trying to understand this in purely physical terms. How do we get you know, asymmetric macroscopic phenomena from time symmetric laws? Lots of stuff happens in between Boltzmann and David Albert. David Albert puts that program in, in a kind of conceptual focus that makes it clear what the logical pieces are that you need to put in place. To under to under to derive the macroscopic asymmetries from the laws together with boundary conditions. So suppose that we've got that problem solved, or at least we know we understand the contours of a sort of explanation that would um, render compatible the manifest temporal asymmetries of, of the macroscopic phenomena with the underlying time symmetry of the laws. Um, now, how do you connect that to the sorts of as temporal asymmetries that are part of human experience? It's not just that we see processes happening in one direction and not the other. It's that our experience seems to have some built-in temporal asymmetries. David Albert was the first person to really, really um, seriously bring this discussion and foundations of uh, physics into direct contact with questions about human experience. And he did it in the following way. He said, oh, well, let's, let's, well, actually that's not ex exactly right. So people like Horowitz and Hugh Price had been talking about this um, for a long time before. Um, but, but he was the one that brought this particular program in foundations of physics into conceptual focus and then tried to connect it to these things. Um, so in his book, what he does is he says, okay, so there are two. This is, this is time and chance. Time and chance. And and I mean, too, I mean, what I love about David's stuff is that that on the one hand, there's this, pro this kind of bottom up project in foundations of physics where you're trying to understand, you know, um, sort of the physics of, of temporal asymmetries. But then there's this kind of analytic stuff that's looking at human experience, trying to characterize those asymmetries and to connect the two. So there's this top down project that's kind of analytic bottom up project. Bottom-up project has been going on in physics for a long time, and a recognized part of trying to understand kind of foundational problems in physics. The top-down project is much more philosophical, um, and it's not in nearly as good shape, I think, as the bottom-up project. But so this is what he said: There's two of them. There's this temporal asymmetry. We seem to know more about the past than the future, in some sense, which needs to be carefully characterized. Um, and then there's this thing that we think that we can affect the past, but not the future. Um, and it's, and, um, I large agreement with him on the temp, on the informational stuff. I don't like the way that he does the, um, the, the causal stuff, the idea that we can affect the, the past, but not the future. And the reasons are just, Wait, you mean we can affect the future, but not the past. Yes. That's what I mean. Oh, okay. Yes, that's exactly. Right. Um, the reasons are largely just, uh, he does it in counterfactual terms, and I don't like counterfactuals. Um, he, I think there's a better way of capturing the content of causal claims, I think. So it's really sort of working within that program, various like little in-house adjustments to things. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, he, he didn't really put his finger on and try to understand um, the point that I see put much more clearly in that Penrose quote, 
which is this this idea that when we experience the world, we we really do. And this to me is the deepest phenomenological difference between time and space, in fact. And so I, I'll, I'll say, and I'll say what it is. And I, I should say too, I mean, I think I'm a lot more patient than most philosophers of physics at really just being okay with the squishy things, you know, trying hard instead of just dismissing them, trying hard to really clearly understand the way that our experience feels to us. Um, and, and this to me is a really big part of it that I hadn't seen talked about before, except maybe a little bit in Herman Weil, where, you know, if you, if you cast your eyes across a landscape, you think of the landscape as a kind of fixed object that's merely coming into view. Right? You think it's there, and it's my experience is just seeing different parts of it. We don't experience time that way. We experience time as though it's not a fixed object that's merely coming into view, but it's something that's coming into being as it's experienced. It seems very right to me to say that, and I wanted to understand what's, what does it mean like, what is that difference? And I think the this is the part that connects to the self-reference stuff. I think it's this idea of there being facts about the world that you can't stabilize independently of the thoughts, that you can't treat them as though they're already there waiting to come into view, and you don't experience them as merely, you know, coming into your horizon. Um, and that, that, I think, you need a couple... You know, you need a couple to get that piece of the puzzle right. You need to a properly characterize it analytically, and I think you need to add um, to the sort of Albert lower program the things that I want to, you know, that I put my finger on in terms of self-reference. Well, a few things. One, I I have done a lot of episodes on time and and time's arrows, but one arrow that y you didn't give your moniker to it in our conversation, but in your your paper, you refer to it as the practical arrow, the fact that we can affect the future, but not the past. That is not an arrow that I think has come up or that is often really discussed. There is this epistemic arrow that's often discussed. How can we remember the past, but not the future, but not how can we can affect the future, but not the past. Uh, you also you put a flag in how this connects to quantum mechanics. So I want to get back to that too. I should also, I, but I I wanted to say you mentioned that David does causality or talks about causality with a lot of reference to counterfactuals, and he and Barry definitely love counterfactuals. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm also I'm not a. a a huge fan of, of counterfactuals either, but that does raise the question how you do like to deal with causality, how you would augment this or change this program. Um, I, let me actually say, in fairness to David and Barry, they do talk about, uh, they don't call it the practical arrow, they call it the causal arrow, but if you look yeah. at what they say, it's all about the direction of influence. Okay, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, causation is like one of these beautiful topics in a way, because it used to be that everybody thought that, well, causation clearly is part of the mind independent fabric of the world. It's, you know, the fundamental ordering relation of, of, of the physical world. That's the way people used to think of causality. And one of the interesting things is the way in which, you know, um, uh, in the stuff about the arrow of time has, has, um, at least in this particular literature, and I think not out there in the kind of the rest of the physics world, people are much more inclined to think of somehow it as associated with agency and the relationship between agents. And Okay, so the way that I do the causality stuff is um, I like to think in interventionist terms. Why do I like to think in interventionist terms? Because um, I think, A, it's, Codified, it does capture um, the the notion of causation 
that's operative in most of the kind of practical sciences, so most experimental sciences, and gives a formalization that even though people talk about intervention counterfactuals, really what they're talking about is hypotheticals. What would happen, you know, what what would happen under the following, you know, fully specified um, hypothetical condition. And, I, and then I think, then I think, instead of taking agency for granted and using it to derive a causal arrow, give an in interventionist account of the content of causal claims, and then see how and why embedded agents would have a need for beliefs or, um, about causation. And then with regard to our putting a flag in quantum mechanics, was that with relation to the practical arrow or the arrow of becoming or the epistemic arrow, one place in which quantum or the, the microscopic came up in your writing, and I, I thought this was very interesting, is that we're, we are information consuming and using beings. And you mentioned that our senses are attuned to the macroscopic rather than to the microscopic because the macroscopic is where information is preserved or records are maintained. Is this all connected? It's all connected, but the quantum stuff is, is uh, not direct. So uh, I'll say the way that I think the dialectic goes. So if you're working in a classical world, you have this problem about understanding, you know, if you're taking the laws to be time symmetric, um, and you're trying to understand temporal asymmetries, most of the literature, um, and I think it's right that it does this, most of the literature on temporal arrows stays at, at, you know, kind of at the level of classical physics or takes the kind of effectively classical level for granted and thinks there's going to be a quantum substructure, but um, there's no, we don't need to understand, we, we need an understanding of the arrow of time. Um, maybe not need the right at least as a first pass we would like to be able to understand the arrow of time without appeal to quantum mechanics i mean david does show and other people have t talked about the ways in which quantum mechanics might help but but most of this literature is understood by trying to derive um asymmetries by assuming cl you know classical laws the way that i understand the arrow the practical arrow that i just talked about um, is is in that program you assume classical laws but a lot of the explanation for me has to do with um, what happens when you take kind of the menta broadly mentaculous program so the parts of that I don't like but let's just since it's something that that people will you know be familiar with take the kind of mentaculous program or some broadly neo Boltzmannian understand Boltzmannian understanding of the foundations of quantum mechanics. So you take some boundary condition in the past, underlying um, time symmetric laws. You combine them to derive asymmetries at the macroscopic level. Um, and then what do I say you need to add to that to get the practical arrow? What I say you need to add to that is self-reference. So what does that do and how does that go? Well, you assume that your agents, your, 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 um, you're, you're acting in the world that you're representing and you ask questions like what features of the world could you have information about? Now you tell the whole Albert story about how the macroscopic environment is littered with records, records, um, you know, like sort of information care, information embodying um, features of the macroscopic environment that because of the boundary condition in the past um, allow us to interfere it, you know, sort of um, carry information about it in the sense that, you know, applying um, uh, uh, applying a past hypothesis plus all of the elements of the, I don't know how much of this I should say, so I'll be a little bit more explicit. What does it mean to say that, uh, that there are records of the past? It means, and I'm just reciting here the Albert story, it means that um, you can infer from the macroscopic state of uh, semi-ordered of semi-ordered adiabatically isolated systems in your environment facts about their past. Okay. 
um, that gives us a, a, a large source of information about the past that we don't have the, about the future because there's no boundary condition in the future that would let us make those inferences in the future direction. Okay. So what do you need to add to that to get the practical arrow? I think once you add to that, that we're acting in the world that we're representing and that our interact that our that our our actions have this have the status of interventions for reasons I can say a little bit more about, but maybe you don't need to know. You can take on faith for the minute. What happens when you conditionalize on an action, uh, some future action, on sort of the past hypothesis of the present macro state, the current surveyable macro state of the world? Like for example. What happen? What will happen if I walk across a sandy beach? If I drop an ice cube into a warm glass of water? If I dig a ditch? If I build a house? Okay. What will happen is that those actions will leave future records of their occurrence. I walk across a sandy beach. There will be footprints. I drop a glass in. A, I drop an ice cube in a warm glass of water. It will be a little bit more. Um, melted in the future. Um, I dig a ditch, you know, it will be moving towards a higher entropy state, but it will be currently, you know, it will be in a semi ordered state, it will be evolving from a lower entropy state. So, this is the way that you get that, um, you get a kind of asymmetry in our inferences from the past into the future. But the thing about actions that depend on my decisions is this crucial thing about interference is because when I'm making a decision, what do I do? I ask myself, what would the world be like if I aid rather than bead or seed? And the, 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 the decision itself is formed by my assessment of the downstream effects of potential action. So it, there's a way in which, if I'm representing the world, and I'm representing the fact that I'm part of the world, and my decision makings are part of my decision making was part of the world. And I take seriously the idea that that's how the decision is made. I represent potential actions, and the one that I choose is depends on assessment of downstream effects. Um, that means I can't stabilize my beliefs about the future until I stabilize my decisions. And in the context of deliberating about it, I'm going to be representing the world in terms of the potential. So here's a decision-making agent going through the world. I can't, it's not just that I'm ignorant of the future. It's that my beliefs about the future and my beliefs about possible future and the, my beliefs about the outcomes of potential actions of mine aren't stabilized independently of my beliefs about the future. So they, it has that sort of, um, you know, I, uh, um, that, that's the kind of sense or the content or the meaning that I give to this idea that we, can't, we don't experience the world as they're already waiting to come into view, but effectively decided by the very processes that I'm undergoing now of being represented and being represented in certain ways. So it, it becomes resolved into actuality in the context of my making decisions and acting on the basis of those decisions. And this is the negative kind of interference that you mentioned. Well, negative interference is what keeps you from stabilizing right. the world. Because, you know, as soon as you, as soon, anytime you kind of try to stabilize your beliefs about the world, you can create negative interference between your beliefs and the way the world is by using your belief as a kind of lever on the basis of which to do something different. I originally started thinking about this stuff before I was thinking in terms of self-reference um, with this little puzzle that comes from Michael Scriven called The Paradox of Predictability, where he says, you know, how is it possible that we could create, or I mean, he puts it in terms of human prediction, but partly because I wanted to demystify it, I put it in terms of like a little mechanical device that, um, <laughs> you know, will do the opposite of what you predict it will do. 
So the idea is we can construct such a device. It's not hard to like write down a physical model of such a device in classical mechanics. So we know that this kind of a device is physically possible, and yet this is in deterministic theory. Oughtn't it be possible in principle to predict everything that would happen in this theory? What happened? What happens if you have full information about the past? You know the physical laws. You ought to be able to compute the future, but you're forced to feed any computation or any prediction you make into a device about what it will do into a device that's going to do the opposite of what you predict. So that was how I originally, before I was, before I realized it was self-reference at bottom. That was how what I was thinking. I was thinking, what on earth is going on here? Is a is a purely mechanical situation in which you can create a device that will do the opposite of what's predicted of it. And yet it seems like there ought to be a mechanism for predicting what it would do. What happens if you put them into communication? And the, the beauty of it is that um, we can ask our theory because we have a physical theory that is deterministic and yet allows for this thing. So you can treat this as a purely a problem in physics. Um, but then I saw, I mean, you know, in thinking about that and in banging my head against it, um, uh, it, it became clear to me that the real problem is interference. And in this, in that original example, you had interference between a device and something that it causes to happen, which is connected to the situation we're in when we're deliberating about the future that we're acting in, right? That is, our beliefs about the future are going to interfere with what, and, and any belief we form can interfere with itself by doing the opposite of what you thought you were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking in those terms, but what, but um, you know, that, that's the situation we're in when we're looking into our own futures. We're in the position of not being able to stabilize belief in advance on pain of negative interference. So that's why I say the future is open in that sense. We can't stabilize it in advance on pain of negative interference. Do you think that another good example to try to make this more concrete for our listeners would be something like stock picking or gambling? Perfect. So the phenomena, the world that we live in is rife with negative interference. So here's the way to, so I, you know, uh, I gave you the simple example of the self-referential -refer device. Nice example, why? Because it's very clear what you mean by you can't stabilize what you're representing independently of your representation because it's identity in that case. That is what you're representing is my answer to this very question. <laughs> and, you know, as soon as I give the answer, I'm, I'm making true or false the thing that the the thing that I'm saying about it. So in that case, it's very clear. We also know that because for embodied beings representing the world, there's going to be self-reference. There's no representation of totality that doesn't include you. So there's going to be self-reference. How do we connect it to these other interesting things, other kinds of interference? I say, well, you just notice that you and your representational activity are causally connected in the world that you're moving to. And what do I mean by causally connected? What I mean is that, you know, there are law-like probabilistic relationships between what you do and what you decide and things that will happen in the world. So you get you start from this very sort of localized form of self-referent of, of interference that's centered on you and your activity. Okay, I can't represent me and my activity independently of what I do and what I believe, but that's just a kind of trivial thing. But then you notice that those things are connected to all kinds of things in your environment. So, um, and the more general negative, uh, the more general phenomenon of negative interference or positive interference, there are both types, is just, you know, features of the world that are um, probabilistically connected to the way that you represent them. Okay. So I'm moving through the world, I'm forming beliefs about the future, but of course my beliefs about the future are guiding my actions, right? So there's a strong positive correlation between what I believe about the future and the way that I act. Um, and the way that I act is connected to all kinds of other things, like, um, you know, what I'm going to see in my room tomorrow, depending on what I decide now, what other people are going to believe about me, what other people are going to do, and, and so on. So we're moving through a world that's heavily affected 
by our actions and because our actions depend on what we believe heavily def- heavily infected by um you know our own beliefs so we're moving through exactly the part of the environment in which interference is strongest um and uh, so we're we're in this position all the time that's the native position of the embedded agent is that you know our beliefs about the future are going to interfere with the facts that those beliefs represent in the social world though there's all kinds of so any time so that's just talking about a single agent moving through um uh uh you know a natural environment where their own beliefs are going to destabilize facts about the future that they're representing but look what if you're moving through an environment where um sort of what you believe is connected to what other like you're all trying to game the system right um that is so the the there's going to be all kinds of facts anytime you have a you're forming beliefs about a domain where your beliefs about that domain feed back into the domain and affect what's true of the domain you've got interference and any kind of social setting in which people are trying to game the system um like stock prices or like elections or it has exactly that form so think about election um you know sort of polls people take stock of you know sort of what current opinion in the in the populace is they create public indices of those and then people react to the public index index right so people will say oh the polls are looking this way i better vote strategically and then that changes the facts that so that that's the the general setting and as soon as you see the general you know the general form of interference you see it, that it arises all the time it arises for a single agent in a natural environment but it arises much more saliently in social environments where the facts that are being represented are partly social facts hmm. or sensitive to social facts. Now this is kind of orthogonal but have you thought at all about how this framework we've been discussing relates at all to quantum measurement and Good. the interference with quantum systems when we try to measure them? Perfect. Yeah. So that's where I was going, which is, so this other stuff is all about in, it, you see how it arises in a classical setting and you see why in a classical setting, because of these asymmetries that interference gets channeled in the future direction. You know, we can stabilize facts about the past because we've got records and our beliefs are, aren't, you know, aren't going to change the records. So our information about the past is largely insensitive to the beliefs that we form about it but in the future it's not for the reasons that i just said um so in a classical setting with the kind of you know ordinary understanding of the thermodynamic arrow you get this nice asymmetry where interference is channeled into the future and then you say okay well, what happens when you do quantum mechanics when you, um I, there's a very uh you know natural way of understanding what's happening in quantum measurement as exactly this the quantum formalism tells us that the facts that we're trying to measure um, are not stabilized independently of, as it were, the questions that we put to them. So we can't treat them as there already or there anyways. So there's a way of reading the kind of Wheeler-style participatory nature of qu- our, you know, our interactions with the quantum world that shows you its interference. It satisfies... Like when you see this done well, and I'm I'm working on stuff where I will do it like carefully and precisely and well. As soon as you see it made precise, you see quantum measurement um, suffers from interference. And the thing I like about putting it in this way goes back to what I said before about why the concrete setting is um, sort of illuminating. It's not a it's not a concern about ontology. It's not a worry about ontology. It's a worry about representation. And it's not that the quantum world isn't there or that there is no way of consistently describing it. It's not there independently of the questions that we put to it. Mm. Um, 
So we can't treat it as there already or there anyway. And as soon as you think about the logic of measurement, that's what the logic of measurement is. The logic of measurement is this is the way that we schematize a measurement situation. You have an apparatus. The apparatus interacts with an object system. And the state of the apparatus after the interaction is a reflection of the state of the system, of the object system before the interaction. That's how, that's the way that we've learned to schematize measurement. That's built into the logic of calling an interaction a measurement. And then when we look at, so, so when I use those phrases that we can treat what we're looking at or what we're measuring as there already or there anyway, that's a way of capturing the idea that it, it, um, it uh, adheres to the, lo the interaction between the two adheres to the logic of measurement. Um, and we normally think of the external world as being like that too, right? It, it affects us and our state after the interaction reflects its state just prior to it. Quantum mechanics, we know, the formalism tells us that our interactions with microscopic systems um, don't have the logic of measurement so construed. So that, that's the way that I think of it, as connecting mm -hmm. to measurement. But so in that case, it's not ice. It, we don't have the temporal arrow. It's not like it, the past stuff is there, but the future stuff isn't. It's that every interaction with the quantum world um, does not have the logic of just seeing something that was there already, or there anyway. You know this this conversation about self-reference and physics has me curious about your thoughts on the self and physics in two ways that aren't really aren't necessarily connected to self-reference but where ourselves are very important and the two things that i have in mind are the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics where the self is very important i think for probability and then the other thing i had in mind is anthropic reasoning and the multiverse and we totally don't have to discuss either of these things if you don't want to but i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on these two areas in the cell so i think i don't have anything illuminating just because i haven't thought about it carefully about uh, to say about the anthropic stuff um the the um stuff about everett and, and many worlds um yeah, I mean, it is something that I thought about. And I think it's, um, again, just in the spirit of trying to understand if I imagine myself into a many world setting, I, I take it sort of on faith that that's the way the, the world is. How do I understand my own experience? And in particular, how do I understand uncertainty about the future? Um, and I think, I mean, you know, what I say about that, this was like one of my earliest papers in quantum mechanics, like way back before I ever really thought about the cell, was um, focused on that question. Um, and I think it really is, um, you know, basically what David, um, David Wallace and Simon Saunders think. That is, when you're looking into the future, you know, you can't think that there's any objective uncertainty about the way the universe in a, in a third person sense or the universe intrinsically is, there's got to be some, like, so what, what's going on there? I'm pre-measurement, I'm gonna carry out a measurement. Um, I know that each post-branch um, version of me is gonna be looking at, you know, seeing one, suppose I'm, making a spin a measurement in the x direction of the spin half particle each version of me each sort of post or i'll put it each one of my post measurement descendants is going to be seeing a definite result um what kind of uncertainty could i possibly have um beforehand that was the question that i was asking um and i think you know i said something false about this the first time I thought and wrote about it. Um, hmm. And, but, 
and 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 I needed to think a, a lot harder about it. But what I said the first time was, well, what I don't know is, um, I can't remember what what did I say the first time. <laughs> That's right. Um, I I thought that what um, you know that there could be some sort of pre measurement uncertainty, and the pre measurement uncertainty attached to what one would see when one opened one one's eyes. And my thought was. Look, it's like you have a bunch of, you know, sort of children and you're sending them off into a jungle and, you know, there's a certain number of tigers and a certain number of lions and a certain number of, I don't know, cats. Um, and they, and you're going to give them, they have to have the same credence function. You're going to give them a credence function, um, you know, given the distribution of tigers and lions and so on, that they're going to see at any you know within any inter any interval of time whether they're going to see a lion or a, a tiger so that was my thinking you know in but I, I think in fact there can't be any pre-measurement uncertainty and the reason actually has to do with the fact that you have no way pre-measurement of even framing a question about a particular post-measurement branch so you can't say you know i wonder whether the version of me at branch number one is going to be seeing, you know, a spin up or spin down because you have no way of referring to, there's no discriminating relationship that you bear to any one of your downstream descendants that would allow you to frame a question about that branch, day ray. If you could, then you could have uncertainty because you could say, what will the version of me at that branch be seeing? But precisely because of your sym the symmetry of your connections, to your downstream descendants, you can't do that. The only way you have a referring to the branches is a, a spin up branch or a spin brown, down branch. So I think the only kind of uncertainty there is is post measurement uncertainty. Before you open your eyes, you can shut your eyes. You are standing at some branch. So you do bear some kind of physical discriminating relationship to the branch that would allow you to entertain a day ray thought. I wonder what the result is at this branch. Um, so that, that's the way that I, I think of probability from, um, from an Everett perspective. And one way to, I mean, the, the kind of cute way of phrasing it so that it's not about uncertainty is you can phrase it as, uh, uh, as surprise. How surprised should I be that I'm seeing, given my pre-measurement state, how surprised should I be? that I'm seeing um, spin up rather than spin down. And you can also put it not in terms of uncertainty, but in terms of a kind of internal indeterminism. You can say, um, what is the, uh, is, is it possible to predict my post-measurement state from my pre-measurement state for a given me? And the answer there is no, even though the laws are deterministic. So again, a way of, of seeing the, the um, not quite uncertainty, but surprise or indeterminism arising from an internal perspective. I'm curious about the spirit in which you're thinking about probability from the Everett perspective. So you mentioned David Wallace and Simon Saunders, and you're at Johns Hopkins where Sean Carroll is now, and he's a very outspoken advocate of many worlds. So I'm wondering if you're thinking about probability or solving probability in this spirit in the spirit of somebody who's just interested in the implications of the various interpretations of quantum mechanics or if you're trying to uh, solve these problems because this is the interpretation that you advocate for is most promising um the truth is i don't have a dog in that fight i mean there are you interesting know yeah, so I really don't. Um, I think if you're an Everettian, you should um, think of probability in a self-locating way, as David Wallace and David uh, David Wallace and Sean and Simon Saunders do. So that part I think is right. What do I believe about the foundations of quantum mechanics? I think what I just said a minute ago about the participatory stuff. Um, might be the right way to think about it, but I don't have strong, I think, I feel like we don't understand, I feel like 
we will know when we have the right interpretation and none of the ones that we have right now seem right. They're all illuminating in different ways. I definitely don't like the Gongyun Jiu. It doesn't seem natural at all to me. Mm. I, um, so I, I, I don't um, have much more illuminating to say. I see the, you know, I wrote, wrote a paper arguing that David Albert style space time is not fundamental was the right way to think about it. Um, I've written about the Everett stuff. I'm going to write this thing on the participatory stuff. So I just, I don't know that we are even close to really understanding it right now. Hmm. And that any one of these is the full and complete and final story. Okay. Very interesting. I was, I think it was uh, Tim, Tim Moglin. I was, I was talking who, as you know, is, uh, a very devout Bohmian who said that there are three theories or interpretations though that are the only really only dogs in the race to use your your phrase that's many worlds and spontaneous collapse theories and then Bohmian mechanics am I should I interpret you as saying that you don't think any of these three is the correct one or the most promising one, even they're not fully developed, or just that you don't want to pick one of these three, um, or their future descendants and variants. I think there are ways. So it depends what you mean by the Everettian. I feel like when we when we do fully understand quantum mechanics, we will see how it's a version of the Everettian theory. You can see Bohmian mechanics in it. It's also a version of, I mean, you didn't, I, it didn't seem to be on Tim's list from what you said, but I think also see the sense in which space time is not fundamental, which is like David Albert's style quantum mechanics. So um, I don't feel like, at least in my mind, that I've, I've attained the kind of clarity to be able to see all of those things together. But it feels unresolved to me. Okay. Well, I also the... like relating to quantum mechanics a lot. Again, there, that, that's one I feel like we'll be able to see the relational um, interpretation as um, coming naturally out of and not, ne- not entirely distinct from these other ones. Hmm. The, the last thing that I wanted to make sure I asked you a bit about was free will and determinism, because I I know you wrote a book called How Physics Makes Us Free. So because I have a a couple of episodes coming out in in the near future as well, that will be on these topics, I wanted to make sure I asked you a bit about it. But so I don't know if you if you find this annoying to go this far back, but how just for our listeners, how you like to describe determinism in a nutshell, and the problem it at least ostensibly uh, puts for free will. Okay. Um, this has been on my mind because I've been, like so many of the people that have been thinking about this stuff, um, you know, hearing a lot about Sapolsky and his book. So the way that I addressed it in that book and the way that I think is more natural in some parts of philosophy in the the way that engages most directly with physics is in terms of physical determinism. So the idea is that you, um, the physical, so I'll give you the consequence argument, which I still find the most compelling argument, um, uh, which says physical laws. And again, put quantum mechanics aside for the minute, just address it in a purely classical setting. Um, You know, physical laws are deterministic. That means you can derive from the, phys- the state of the universe at any given time the and the physical laws that stays in any other. Um, that means that, I'll state the argument now, that means that uh, you can, no, I'll, I'll state, it, sorry, I'm going to state the argument a little bit more clearly, taking that as the definition of determinism. Past is fixed and out of our control. Laws are fixed and out of our control. Determinism entails that um, the, that 
the future is entailed as a matter of logic from the physical laws plus the past. Therefore, the future is fixed and out of our control. That's kind of the, the usual way of presenting it. I talk about it in a, a slightly different way, but, but the way that what I did in my book was um, sort of take apart the, pre the kind of metaphysical presumptions that go into that way of setting it up. And the way that I would put it now is um, different than the way that I would put it in the book, the right way to understand it. Um, should I say something about that? Yes, please, please. So I think the, the simplest way to say it is we've got this picture and this is a way that connects. So again, this isn't what I said in my book, except in a, in a less focused way. But now I think of it, if, if you take physics seriously and you take in particular relativity seriously, then you realize something that um, is kind of built into the way that the consequence argument is set up is not a part of physics. So the way that we normally think of um, of the world, that is pretty theoretically, we think, you know, there's this kind of, the world is this big spatially extended object and it has a state at one time and a state at other times and its state in the past is fixed and what determinism tells us is, so we kind of picture the world as this great big spatially extended evolving object. And what, and we think that what determinism tells us is effectively as soon as God put down, you know, or specified the positions and momenta of all of the particles of which the universe was made at the very beginning moment in time, or at any moment, you know, as, as soon as those were fixed and the laws of nature um, took over, that everything that was going to happen after that was already fixed. But as soon as you know, physics has kind of moved beyond this picture of time as an external parameter in the world. And this talk of the state of the world um, at one time is not actually well-defined in relativity. It is true, to be sure, that the um, that physicists you know, still do continue to, to treat the world as though it's a big object evolving over time and to speak of the global evolution of the world and to write down the laws uh, as you know, global laws of temporal evolution and partly because they think, well, you can, you know, what relativity tells us is that there isn't a well-defined global uh, state of the world at any given time, but there's a little bit of freedom in how we can slice up the world. It doesn't tell us that we have to, that we can't slice it up, only that there's a little bit of freedom. I think that's the wrong way to think of it. I think what relativity showed us is that there isn't a well-defined, is that this picture of the of the universe as this, a big spatially extended object evolving over time is not right, that there is no well-defined global state of the world at a time. The intrinsic geometry of the world is a relativistic geometry. The laws are local, so now we can replace these global laws of temporal evolution that tell you what the state of the world at one time, how it relates to state of another, and write them in a local form that tells you interaction by interaction, event by event, you know how one thing determines another. And it's true that it's going to be an artifact of those local laws, that if you do make a foliation, the classical laws, if you do carve the world up into time slices, in um, any way, you're going to get global determinism, but we can understand the significance of that by looking lo you know, looking interaction by interaction, event by event, what's actually going on in the kind of intrinsic causal structure of the world. And here's what's interesting. If you take the world line of any kind of embedded system and you ask yourself, just paying attention to the what relativity tells you the set of events at any given time that can affect what goes on at that time that that counts as past at that moment that is a set of events that that you could possibly have in, information about at that moment so what counts as your causal past the set of events that could possibly affect what's happening at that moment and you look even a finite fraction of a second into the future and you ask does the past determine the future, even given the deterministic laws? The answer is no. So the, so if you, if you really pay attention to what things look like from within the universe, and there is no outside the universe, what you get is a bunch of developing systems 
developing kind of asynchronously with respect to one, one another. So if you have systems that you know, are distanced from one another, you can't talk in a rel relativistically well-defined way about what, what's happening now over there. You can just talk about, you know, the, the, you know, what's in my absolute past, what's in my absolute future, and what's in my absolute elsewhere. So the logic of past and future is a little bit different. It's not true, even though the laws are deterministic, that my past determines anything that happens in my future. And the same is true for every system in the world. So you have this kind of mesh-like network of systems developing, you know, sort of bringing in information that's e essentially unpredictable at every moment of their lives, incorporating it into their future. And so that if you, so it's as though I'm doing things over here, I'm creating information that will be a part of the future of systems over there. So that the whole thing is going to add up to a deterministic whole. But in no, at no, in, in no life of any, you know, sort of actual embedded system is its past determining its future. There's always exogenous information that's relevant to what's going to happen that falls outside of its light cone. Hmm. Uh, that's a much more natural, you know, way of understanding what what the physics tells us. Um, but you know, so so that sort of moves questions of determinism, and this connects to the Sapolsky stuff. So that moves the questions of determinism, and I'm going way, way beyond what I did in my books. And, but the way it's the way that I think that I think of it now. So it's hard for me not to want to say it <laughs> instead of going back to what I said. But I think um, there's another thing that is what I talk, part of what I talked about in my book. We also bring to our understanding of the physics an understanding of physical laws that's very different from what physics, um, you know, the way that physics has kind of matured. Like we tend to think of them as kind of relations of necessitation, like iron relations that that force us to, you know, to to that keep the world from doing one thing rather than another. But of course, that's not the way physics thinks of them. They're not laws; aren't causal agents. They capture regularities in what happens, universal regularities in what happens. So when you take those things out of the picture, you get the right picture of time. You know, it's very different from, from what the consequence argument um, suggests. Moreover, you know, think about the right analysis of what the fixity of the past amounts to. It's not like a metaphysical kind of, you know, fixity about the initial state of the universe. None of that stuff, that whole package of ideas it's just an it's just a really poor shit for modern physics. It's brought onto the physics and the understanding of the determinism from outside. So, but but what it does do, um, it moves the whole discussion of determinism into the realm of okay. So we're looking, you know, from the point of view of the on the ground causal order um, at at what you know, what determines what in in the world. And I think what Sapolsky is doing is he's making it very vivid and very clear that if you pick out, you know, sort of take, it doesn't do, I mean, I've, what I like about the Sapolsky stuff is that it's not depending on any of these metaphysical ideas. You know, it's not depending on a, a view of time. It's not, he's saying, if you pick out any human behavior, and you ask yourself, what is the causal basis of that behavior? You can find at different time scales this whole layered structure of facts that um, that um, sort of that that go into shaping and um, and and influencing and ultimately he thinks determining what that behavior will be. So he says, for example, you know, you make a decision to. Uh, this isn't an example of his. I can't think of his examples. You make a decision to um, to not work out today or something. I don't know, or um, or to eat to eat sweets. Let, let's say to eat a big piece of cake, even if you know you shouldn't have it. And he says, like, what is it that that you know? What is it in the world that makes that decision? You know, what when and where was that decision made? And then he he sort of says, well, you know. There are all of these events going on in your brain, and the events that are going on in your brain are, you know, they have a causal history that partly de depends on the kind of chemical environment, and those have a causal history that partly depends on 
the you know uh like facts in in your mother's womb when you you know you were developing and that and then you have genes and those depend on so he so you can sort of trace out you know the causal history of those behaviors in a, in a way that he seems to think crowds you out leaves no room for you where do you think that you get into it into the picture right. so i think you know his book even though i mean all of the criticisms that people have made um of it are right he um I can say something about those, but you'll probably hear lots about those. But I think it makes this really useful point, which is, you know, it, it looks like if you look at the world through the lenses of the biologist, um, what you find when you look for the causal basis of human behavior are things like genes, hormones, um, you know, all of these factors that were shaped by evolutionary um, influences outside of your control long before you were ever on scene, many of them. And my response to all of that is, what do you think you are? You're some, you're a minded body. You're some mixture of genes and hormones and, you know, uh, chemistry that was partly the product of the early environment in the womb, plus personal experiences. You're all of that stuff. And when you make a decision, um, it does come from you if it comes from that stuff. You know, he's right that that um, if we want a notion of moral responsibility and um, it's going to have to recognize that it shouldn't be founded on what he thinks free will would have to be which is you know something coming from outside the causal order you have to take seriously that that's what you are you're a minded body and every part of you has a history but i think i mean that that shouldn't be surprising it's not surprising to me if 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 someone has a notion of personal autonomy and moral responsibility that's incompatible with that, then I think their notion of personal autonomy is probably too strong and magical in some way. But I don't think any of the philosophers that think of themselves as compatibilists who have thought about free will, um, that they're seriously challenged by that. That was a great uh, summary and, and rebuttal. And let me just make sure that I've put my finger on, on the crux of your Argument. So what he believes, and he uses this anecdote from Henry James about turtles being all the way, it's turtles all the way down. Um, for us to have free will, there has to be a sort of free floating turtle that is you, that is, as you put it, free from the causal order that makes the decision sort of out of the blue, maybe in a, a dualist picture, uh, that you're going to have that cake or you're not going to work out. Whereas on your view, that just isn't what you are. Uh, you are not some, or uh, let me put it this way. In our folk intuition of what a person is uh, or what a mind is, it is maybe this free floating turtle. But what you are in actuality is a minded body, uh, and you are the sum of your hormones and their past and all of these things. And when a decision uh, flows out of all of these things, it is your decision. And that's where free will comes from. Yeah. I mean, it's a little stronger than that. I, you know, um, yeah, it's a little stronger than that because you do need to make a distinction between you know, uh, sort of behaviors that I don't have voluntary control over mm -hmm. and behaviors that I do. So you need to understand a little bit about, you know, how it is that, and this is something that Dennett will talk about, and it's something that he's emphasized in contradict in, in arguing specifically with Sapolsky's. You need to understand how we evolved the ability to make decisions and that when I do make decisions, you know, those decisions to the extent that they come from my plans and priorities and projects and and yes i would say and the sort of person that i am including my disposition some of which were inherited some of which were formed in the womb and shaped by my experiences so then they come from me you know it's sapolsky who says i mean and this is all implicit in his argument it's not something he says and it's something that i think appeals to the idea a lot of people have of themselves which is you know i'm somehow this indivisible locus of mental life distinct from brain and body and that 
Um, but but the way it would, and so that's why it appeal Sapolsky's line of argument appeals to people. But what he actually says is, you know, he just describes, um, you know, sort of the way in which the you know behaviors are partly rooted in your genes, partly rooted in your hormones, partly rooted in your right, and then assert. You know, there's effectively no room for me. That is, as if you absorb yourself completely into the fabric of the world, um, of course you're gonna your behavior to the extent that it comes from you is gonna come from some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it's it's a very seductive style of argument, but he seems to think that look at the world. I don't see me. I see genes. I see hormones. I see, and I see, I see me. That's what I am. <laughs> what do you think you are? You know. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not just a passive responder to, um, you know, to forces that impinge on me. I make decisions and my decisions are partly based on, you know, and the, 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 the sort of cognitive apparatus that gives me a kind of internal locus of control. But it's mm -hmm. not distinct from, you know, it's not separate from the natural order. It's part of it. Hmm. Well, uh, two things you mentioned uh, Dennett, and I think his book, Freedom Evolves, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. probably a, a good place Not for me. readers to get at this evolution of the decision making <laughs> apparatus. And then you also mentioned um, that we have this conception of ourselves as indivisible, <laughs> of the self as an indivisible locus of, I don't know, I don't know what Next it was. Time. That comes of from... mental life, yeah. I had a, a conversation with one of Dan's collaborators at Tufts, Mike Levin, and he he so stressed great. that he doesn't know of any uh, individual agents or intelligences. Everything is a collective. And if you're looking for a fr single free-floating turtle, you're just not going to find that anywhere. Uh, okay, so this part I disagree with, and I know you want to end, but this part I actually deeply disagree with, and it's um, so I think there is a kind of unity, a very special kind of unity that selves have and persons uh. have, and they have as a result of a kind of informational integration. And that when we say I, you know, that is a kind of unity, but it's not a material unity. It's not a unity that comes from the bottom up, and it's not a unity of matter. It's a, it's a special kind of unity that has to do with informational integration and synthesis, and it's a kind of, I mean, this part, my book is, you know, to a large extent, partly about this. And I think it's that informational unity that's, that's essential to the notion of a self as we use it. But, but it's very, but the, the seductive part, uh, or the very difficult part of arguments, you know, against free will is exactly this. We look at the natural world, and all we see are parts. We see little things and we see a causal order that, that, you know, is traces, but we don't see, you know, we don't see this indivisible loci of mental life. I think, I think there are, um, you know, there, there, there is um, a kind of unity that's central to human cognition that when we make descent decisions, we sort of collectivize and subsume the kind of parts of ourselves. I think that's essential to really understanding the sense in which agents and agents of the kind that we are um, do localize control and essential to the difference between behaviors that come from me and ones that are merely things that my body does. Um, but, but that's a disagreement between me and to some extent, Dennett, though when I talk to him about this, he says he agrees with me, but there's certainly parts of his writing that, that suggest that, that a lot of people have interpreted. And I think you know, interpreted because the the rhetoric is suggestive as this that that's an illusion. I don't think it's an illusion, but I don't think it's a it's a material type of unity. Okay, well, Janan, we we have covered a, a lot of ground. Uh, this I don't know, maybe this was nine months in the the waiting for me, but it was absolutely terrific. So thank you again so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Thanks so much for having me. Take care.